Hello and welcome to the Week 9 podcast for LWS 011 Journalism Law. I'm Peter Black. Last week we looked at the principle of open justice and how it is an important measure for transparency and accountability when it comes to the courts. This week we're going to look at contempt of court, which in many ways is the flip side to open justice. If you don't comply with the rules that the court sets out, you will find yourself in contempt of court, and some of those relevant rules do indeed relate to those principles of open justice. So what we're going to do then today is to have a bit of an introduction to contempt of court and looking at the various different types of contempt, uh, before focusing then on two types of contempt in a little bit of detail, what's described to what's described as sub judice contempt, and then what is considered to be scandalising contempt. So, despite the existence then of, of open justice, journalists do face restrictions on their reporting of crime and their justice system. So it's not as though the principle of open justice means that journalists can say anything they like about matters that are before the courts. Instead, contempt of court actually operates as one of the major restrictions on what journalists can and cannot do when it comes to reporting and commenting on matters of crime and other matters that are before the justice system. Now, it's also worth noting that as with most areas of media law, contempt does not just apply to journalists, although more often than not, it actually does. Now, contempt of court aims to prevent interference with the administration of justice. And the classic definition comes from Lord Diplock in the Attorney General and Times newspaper case, where his lordship said that conduct in relation to proceedings in a court of law, which tends to undermine that system, or to inhibit citizens from availing themselves of the courts of law for the settlement of their disputes. So contempt of court has very much at its heart this idea that you can't let anyone, be it journalists or otherwise, interfere with the administration of justice. Now, a recent example of this was the high-profile case of Hogan and Hinch. Now, in that case... The broadcaster Darren Hinch was sentenced by a magistrate to serve five months of home detention following the naming of two serial sex offenders. This naming and shaming occurred through Hinch's radio show and also at a rally. It's worth noting, though, that this was not Hinch's first fling with contempt. In 2008, Hinch had breached suppression orders provided by Melbourne County Court in a sex offending molestation matter by publishing the identity of the offender. Now, Hinch raised a constitutional challenge to the validity of the suppression orders which had been made. Hinch argued before the court that the legislation um, under which the suppression order was made infringed the implied freedom of political communication by inhibiting the criticism of legislation and its application in the courts and the ability to seek legislative and constitutional change and changes in court practice by public assembly and protest and the dissemination of factual data concerning court proceedings. With respect to this challenge by Hinch, the court was ultimately not persuaded. And this really serves as a rationale or a justification uh, for this law relating to contempt of court. So Chief Justice French said that an essential characteristic of the courts is that they sit in public. Its rationale is the benefit that flows from subjecting court proceedings to public and professional scrutiny. It is also critical to the maintenance of public confidence in the courts. The open court principle serves to maintain that standard. However, it is not absolute. So the principle of open justice is limited in a number of circumstances to serve the administration of justice, including hearings involving secret processes or technical matters, breaches of confidence, identities of police informants and undercover police officers, all of which we considered last week. Now, the court held that suppression orders are made within the legislation to be in the public interest, and that contrary to Hinch's arguments, the suppression orders were not made contrary to a derived submission derived from the Constitution that all federal and state courts be open to the public. That Hinch failed to attract the implied freedom of political communication within the Constitution, as legislation for the suppression order was legitimate and compatible with the maintenance of our constitutionally prescribed system of government. So contempt of court once again operates as another limit uh, on this principle of open justice that we considered last week. And nor does this notion of contempt of court infringe the implied freedom of political communication that we considered earlier in the semester. Okay, moving then on to uh, contempt. 
So contempt can be in relation to either civil or criminal proceedings in court. So criminal court proceedings are in relation to breaches of criminal legislation, and civil proceedings involve individual or company disputes generally. Criminal contempt aims to maintain the integrity of the court as a matter of public interest and the undermining of the court's authorities. Now, civil contempt is designed to punish actions which undermine the integrity of the court with respect to civil proceedings. Now, the High Court does not see this distinction between civil and criminal proceedings as critical. Instead, the court believes that the public interest in the administration of justice is the paramount consideration. It's also worth noting that in the prosecution of contempt, be it civil contempt or criminal contempt charges, it's required to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt, as opposed to the balance of um, probabilities, which is the civil burden of proof. Okay, so what then are the main types of contempt? Now, we're really only going to focus on the first two in any detail, which is sub judice contempt as well as scandalising the court. But there are other uh, forms of contempt, including revealing the deliberations of juries, contempt in the face of the court, and also disobedience contempt. We also need to consider who may be liable for contempt and who may institute proceedings for contempt. So, in terms of who then may be liable, in theory, any person who is involved in the preparation, content, production, distribution, or broadcast can be held liable. Now, normally the publisher is responsible because the publisher is responsible for disseminating the material which is at the heart of the contempt, and the editor has the ultimate and overall control over the contents, even where he or she is personally unaware of the content of the article in question, although an editor who is not personally culpable may not be punished. Now, when we're talking about radio or television broadcasts, it is usually the radio or television station that will be liable for contempt who then may institute proceedings. Now, proceedings for criminal contempt are generally instituted by the Attorney General or the Director of Public Prosecutions, where it is, in his or her opinion, in the public interest that proceedings should be instituted. However, it's not just limited to that. A person with a special interest, for example, a party to litigation in which an alleged contempt has been committed, may also commence a private prosecution for contempt of court. A court or a judge acting on its own may also initiate proceedings for contempt. The object of criminal contempt is to punish the um, contemptor for the acts which have impeded or interfered with the administration of justice, to deter others from committing similar contempts in the future, and to uphold the public interest in maintaining the authority of the courts and the interest of the litigants. Now, penalties for contempt may be in the nature of a fine or imprisonment, and both are unlimited. There is no maximum penalty in terms of fine or imprisonment when it comes to contempt of court. Okay, that then is our introduction to contempt of court. Let's move on by looking at sub judice contempt. So, what do we mean by sub judice contempt? Well, sub judice literally refers to when a case is under a judge. So, sub judice contempt prohibits the publication of information which will have a tendency to prejudice a case before the court. Now, the objective of sub judice contempt is to protect the integrity of the administration of justice from prejudicial publicity, that, such that it would interfere then with the administration of justice. It's also worth noting that sub judice contempt applies to both civil and criminal matters. Now, one of the trickiest questions when we're talking about sub judice contempt is exactly when are proceedings sub judice? Well, basically, proceedings are sub judice if court procedures have commenced and have not been completed. So, in a criminal context, in a criminal context, criminal proceedings have commenced if a person has been arrested. Criminal proceedings are also commenced if a warrant has been issued for an arrest and an information has been laid or notice has been given of an intention to prefer a presentment. Criminal proceedings then remain on foot until the accused has been acquitted, or the time for lodging an appeal has lapsed, or all possible appeals have been heard. So that's from the beginning to the end, all of that is sub judice. Now when we're talking about civil proceedings, Civil proceedings commence when a writ, a statement of claim, or other initiating process has been issued, and they remain pending until the case has been decided. It is unclear as to whether proceedings remain pending until the time for lodging an appeal has expired, or until all appeals have been completed. 
There's also the issue of imminent and inactive proceedings. Um, so are imminent proceedings subdued to say? Now, while it is possible, as they say, to, quote, poison the fountain of justice, end quote, even before it begins to flow, the fact that proceedings are not imminent, the fact that proceedings are imminent is not sufficient to activate the law of contempt. So it, you actually have to have um, the proceedings commence, either by an arrest being issued, if we're talking about a criminal proceeding, or in a civil proceeding, the initiating process having commenced. What about inactive proceedings? Now, where in civil litigation it has become dormant, it will no longer be regarded as pending and the law of subjudice contempt will not apply. However, proceedings will not be dormant simply because the parties are engaged in protracted settlement negotiations. Now, when we're talking about subjudice contempt, we are concerned with uh, the intention here. There must be an intention to publish the allegedly contemptuous material. It's not necessary for there to be an intention to interfere with the administration of justice. It just has to be an intention to publish that material, even if they didn't think that publishing it was going to interfere with the administration of justice. That's the relevant intent here. Uh, it's, this is considered a bit of an anomaly among some criminal law uh, principles, but that's the way the law is with respect to uh, contempt and the intention to interfere with the administration of justice may end up being relevant in other respects, as we will see. Uh, and this is a criticism uh, of contempt law. So that's the relevant intent element. There has to be an intent to publish the allegedly contemptuous material. There then has to be the actual act. So it must be proved then beyond a reasonable doubt that there was a publication and that the publication had a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. So for there to be, therefore, a subjudice contempt, there had to be this uh, intent to publish, it had to be published, and then the publication has to have a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. What do we mean by publication? Now, publication here extends to persons who disseminate the material to others who are likely to directly put the material before the public or a section of the public. Similarly, the source supply of material to another media organisation for publication may also be liable for contempt. It will be no answer that the licensee to whom material is supplied has an independent responsibility to check what it broadcasts. Material placed on the internet is regarded as being published for all the time that it remains available to the public, and subwriters and editors cannot avoid liability for publication by blaming a subordinate. For example, John Laws, the radio host who had read a script on radio concerning a contemptuous matter, was held to still have the ultimate responsibility to check that information even though he was just reading a script. So that's what we mean by publication. The next element is that it had to have a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. Now, a contempt of court will not be lightly found. A contempt will be committed only where, beyond a reasonable doubt, the publication has a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. And the publication must have a real or clear tendency as a matter of practical reality to interfere with the administration of justice in a particular case. The nature and circumstances of the publication must be taken into account to decide whether there is a real or definite possibility of prejudice. A remote of or theoretical possibility of influence or a mere apprehension of injustice is insufficient. It is only necessary also to show that a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice, actual harm or prejudice need not have resulted, just that it had a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice justice. Nevertheless, actual harm may be relied upon as grounds for having a jury discharged or a conviction set aside. Such could be the impact of the prejudicial publicity. Now, the tendency of the publication is not assessed by reference to subsequent events. So whether it was a guilty verdict or a not guilty verdict, that's not going to be relevant to whether there was a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. What we are concerned with instead is the effect of the publication on the ordinary, reasonable member of the community. 
and if the effect of the publication on the ordinary reasonable member of the community is that it had a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice, then that individual or publication will be in contempt of court. A mere intention to interfere with the administration of justice is insufficient unless there is also a tendency to interfere. Now, the internet here, as you might well imagine, raises some particular issues. Since publication is permanent, a worldwide reach, it's searchable via a browser. It also allows instantaneous download and to be able to be copied, cached or mirrored by other sites. So the internet has made this issue of subdued to say contempt much more complicated. That's then our introduction to subdued to say contempt. Let's then have a look at some of the common scenarios that arise when we're talking about sub say contempt. So, when we're talking about judges and magistrates. Now, judges are often regarded as being beyond influence. They're held in very high esteem, at least by other judges. Now, no contempt is committed because judges are assumed to be able to recognise and ignore the influence of pre-trial publicity. The mere fact that a judge was required in a particular case to put prejudicial material out of his or her mind does not make the material contemptuous. Legally, uh, qualified magistrates and coroners are treated in the same way as judges. However, where a magistrate is not required to have legal qualifications, he or she is treated as being more vulnerable to media influence. The next common scenario is where there is a jury is involved. Now, unlike with judges and magistrates, it is assumed that jurors can be improperly influenced by the publication of information or comment. There is, however, a trend towards accepting that a jury can be instructed to ignore this material and not be affected by the published material. That said, prejudicial material with the potential to influence uh, jurors uh, includes the following. So publication of statements as to guilt, publication of statements as to innocence, criticising or disparaging the accused, creating sympathy for the accused or a victim, publishing confessions, publishing prior convictions, prejudging issues awaiting judgment or photographs or film footage of accused persons. Uh, all of this um, can be considered um, potentially uh, able to influence a jury. So we're going to actually now look at this list in a little bit more detail. So, publications of statements as to guilt. So, this is material which blatantly asserts or suggests or creates the impression that the accused person committed the crime with which they've been charged. The assertion of guilt need not be made in respect of the charges and pending trial. It is enough that the assertion would leave the public to conclude that the accused is guilty of those charges. Impugning an accused's defence, such as if the defence is provocation or self-defence, may also be sufficient. An assertion of guilt made in relation to proceedings not involving a jury will not always amount to a contempt. Much as statements of public st uh, statements as to guilt can be contempt, so can statements as to innocence. So publications asserting, implying, or creating the impression that the accused is innocent can equally constitute contempt. So contempt is as much concerned about the risk of acquittal for the guilty as it is for the conviction of the innocent. Statements criticising or disparaging the accused. Publication of general adverse comments about a party in pending proceedings may amount to a contempt, since publications that excite feelings of hostility against an accused may have a tendency to impair the impartiality of the jury or affect the evidence of witnesses. Photographs or film footage of the accused may create an adverse impression of the accused. The more removed the subject matter of the trial, however, the less of the tendency. Next, creating sympathy for the accused or for a victim. A contempt may be committed by the publication of a mode of statements which are calculated to engender sympathy for the accused or the victim of a crime, even where the statements are not directed at the issues to be decided by the jury. Once again, photographs or film footage of the victim's injuries may create sympathy for the victim. Publishing confessions. As a general rule, the media should not publish a statement suggesting the accused has confessed to a crime until the confession has been admitted into evidence. To say a person has confessed is normally tantamount to asserting he or she is guilty. It will also be a contempt to publish a report that evidence has been held to be inadmissible, where the report suggests to the jury that evidence adverse to one of the parties has been withheld from them and there was a real risk the jury would act on this belief. 
Similarly, publishing prior convictions can be a contempt. A contempt is committed by publication of prior convictions, which are deemed by the rules of evidence as being inadmissible due to the prejudice to the accused, which is so serious as to be incapable of removal. Prejudging issues awaiting judgments. It may be a contempt to prejudge any other issues of fact or law, besides guilt or innocence, which must be decided by a court. Now, the prejudgment principle is no longer likely to be an accurate expression of the law in the United Kingdom. However, in Australia, it has been affirmed that prejudgment by the media only amounts to contempt if it has, as a practical reality, a tendency to interfere with the due administration of justice in a particular case. This will be so if there is a real risk that actual or potential jurors or witnesses may be biased or improperly influenced by what is published. Turning then to photographs or film footage of accused persons, which is a very important area. So publication of film or a photograph of an accused person may in some cases have a clear tendency as a matter of practical reality to interfere with the due course of justice by prejudicing the trial of an accused. Publication of film or photographs would be regarded as having the tendency if, at the time of publication, the identity of the accused might come into question in some aspect of the case. Publication of film or photographs might affect or confuse the recollection of a potential witness on an issue as to identity and thus prejudice the defence. It might prejudice the Crown case by providing the defence with an opportunity to discredit the evidence of the Crown's witnesses by suggesting the whole of the identification of the accused was on the published photograph or footage, or might have a tendency to influence the minds of potential jurors by affording them an opportunity to speculate upon the character and personality of the accused. The only way that the media can be assured that it will not be committing a contempt is to assume that the identity will be an issue and to refrain from publishing a photograph or film of an accused person in conjunction with the report relating to the crime. However, each case must be judged on its facts. Where photographs are published during a manhunt, publication of further pictures after an arrest may not amount to a contempt, and this, I think, just makes sense. The media are not entitled to rule out the possibility of any dispute as to identity simply because the police have given assurances to that effect or because a journalist has learnt from the police that a confession has been made or fingerprints found. It is no answer to a charge of contempt that the media were given to understand that the witnesses have already been shown photographs of the accused. The possibility that identity may be an issue can rarely, if ever, be ruled out in a serious charge such as murder, and a sketch drawing of the accused conveys a less precise and realistic impression than a photograph or film footage, and accordingly the publication of a drawing will usually not amount to a contempt. The common practice, however, of showing footage of accused persons being led from a police vehicle to a court building with heads covered by an article of clothing in order to avoid photographs being taken of the accused face was capable of causing viewers, including potential jurors, to wrongly infer that the accused, out of conscientiousness of guilt, did not want his or her face to be seen, and that it would be a better approach to avoid the display of the accused altogether. So I think that's an important point to remember. Now, another common scenario is when we're talking about um, parties to the case. So here, to constitute contempt, there must be a publication which is intended to or has the tendency to influence a party in the conduct of a proceeding by pressure which is improper. It has been suggested, though not yet generally accepted, that the tendency of the material should be measured against the capacity to withstand the pressure of a hypothetical litigant of ordinary fortitude rather than the litigant in question. It is not necessary for the publication to have actually succeeded in interfering with the party. In Australia, pressure is considered improper, where the publication disparages or vilifies a party without justification because he or she is a party or because of the litigation or the allegations made in it. In determining whether a publication has crossed the line from offensive to contemptuous, the whole context must be examined, including the tone of the publication and its fairness and accuracy. The pressure need not be applied by the other side, it may be applied by a third party, and that can constitute sub judice contempt. So there are at least four ways in which a publication may be contemptuous due to its impact on witnesses. First, 
The same material which is held to have a tendency to prejudice or bias jurors may be held to have a tendency to influence the testimony of witnesses. For example, publication of material which prejudices an accused person or which prejudges the issues to be decided in a case. Second, the publication of a photograph of a person accused of a crime due to its effect on witnesses. Three, a publication which censures a witness for giving evidence or which criticises a witness's evidence as being unreliable or untrue if it is a tendency to affect the witness's evidence or to deter potential witnesses from coming forward to testify. And then fourthly, publication of potential interviews with witnesses in advance of a hearing. So through all of these different scenarios, whether we're talking about parties, whether we're talking um, about uh, jurors, or whether we're talking about judges of magistrates, what we're really looking at is whether the publication has a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice. And this is a balancing act. The judge is required to weigh different factors. So there's a few different factors that are relevant to determining this tendency. So the lapse of the time between publication and the proceedings the identity of the statement maker, the relevance of other prejudicial publications, the size and location of the readership or audience, and also the form of publication. Factors not relevant to determining this tendency are the truth of the published statements, that's irrelevant as to whether it has a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice, the strength of the police case against the accused, and also information provided by the police. Now, it's worth noting that publications in the public interest will not be considered sub judice contempt. So in certain circumstances, the public interest in the administration of justice must yield for the public interest in the discussion of public affairs. Uh, and this is now, once again, a balancing approach. The court weighs competing interests and makes a judgment as to which should prevail. Before this can be done, a court must identify the exact nature of the public interest which is claimed to outweigh the public interest and the administration of justice. It is clear that these other considerations can include the ventilation of a question of public concern, the discussion of public affairs, and the denunciation of public abuses. The public interest in the administration of justice would defer to fair and accurate reports of proceedings of courts and parliaments. The report must be published in good faith and without malice and be fairly contemporaneous with the proceeding. This will also be the case where the discussion relates to matters of extreme public importance, such as a major constitutional crisis or an imminent threat of nuclear disaster. So, a range of other measures are available for responding to non-contemptuous adverse publicity. So these are other things that a judge may be able to order rather than um, uh, contempt. So order a permanent stay of the proceedings, order an adjournment of the proceedings, a change of venue, discharging the jury and swearing in a new jury, questioning jurors as to their contact with the publication, allowing the prosecutor or defence to challenge the cause, or making an appropriate direction to the jury, either during the course of the trial or in the summing up, to disregard the publicity concerning the case. Now, relevant considerations here include the extent and nature of the publicity, when it occurred, and the nature of the offence charge, legitimate public interest, and the necessary assumption that jurors understand and follow directions given by trial judges. The need to maintain public confidence in the administration of justice and the public interest in ensuring the judicial processes are not abused and that trials are fair to the people charged means that a permanent stay should be ordered when it is impossible to ensure that a fair trial could be take place. Okay, so that's really focusing then on sub judice contempt. Now let's move on to consider scandalising contempt. Scandalising contempt is the publication of material which tends to detract from the authority and influence of judicial determinations, or which is calculated to impair the confidence of the people in the court's judgments, because the matter published aims at lowering the authority of the court as a whole or that of its judges and excites misgivings as to the integrity, propriety, and impartiality brought to the exercise of the judicial office. Scandalising contempt is concerned with preserving public confidence in the administration of justice as a continuing process. So it aims to preserve the functions rather than the feelings of judges. Now, to constitute a scandalising contempt, the published material must have an inherent tendency to impair or undermine public confidence in the administration of justice. The actual effect of the publication is 
be relevant. Once again, there must be a real risk rather than a remote possibility that public confidence in the administration of justice will be undermined. When assessing the tendency of the publication, the courts have had regard to factors such as the size and location of the readership or audience and the form of the publication. Tendency of the publication is also assessed in light of whether the maker of the statement was a well-known or respected public figure, thereby lending credence to the allegations in the publication. Scandalising contempt does not require proceedings to be pending, although it may be more readily punished if it contains an element of prejudice to a pending case. And again, while scandalising contempt is a criminal offence, it is only necessary to show an intention to publish the material in question, rather than an intention to scandalise the court or to lower its authority. Scandalising contempt may be criticised or contrasted rather with criticism of the courts and their judgments, which is generally regarded as beneficial rather than inimical to the administration of justice. So criticism may relate to a court's decision, a point of law, the state of law in general, comments made by a judge during trial or the leniency or harshness of a sentence meted out by a judge. Indeed, the law encourages the fullest discussion of the doings of the courts provided the discussion is fairly conducted, directed honestly to some definite public purpose and not motivated by malice. Now, let's just consider two different sort of common scenarios arising in the context of scandalising contempt. One is scurrilous abuse, the other uh, relates to allegations of bias. So, scurrilous abuse. This is abuse directed at the private character of a judge. Now, it's regarded as scurrilous abuse only if it impinges upon his or her reputation in fulfilling his or her judicial functions. And the language used here is going to be a relevant consideration. Now, like defamation, where the abuse is excessively extravagant, inflammatory, or unintelligent, there is less of a real risk of impairing public confidence in the administration of justice as no right-thinking member of the public would take it seriously. The abuse is more likely to impair the reputation and credibility of the person who uttered the statement rather than the courts. So that's worth remembering with respect to scurrilous abuse. When we're talking about allegations of bias, it is contempt to incite misgivings as to the integrity, propriety and impartiality with a judge, which a judge brings to the exercise of his or her judicial duties. It will be scurrilous contempt to make unjustified claims that a particular judge or the judiciary as a whole has been affected by some personal bias against a party or has acted malafide or has failed to act with the impartiality required of the judicial office. That said, the following do not constitute contempt. A criticism that a court or judge has been influenced conscientiously or subconscientiously by a particular consideration in respect of a matter which has been determined unless the language produces criticism to mere scurrility. To allege that a judge may, in approaching the problem, be influenced by his or her character and general outlook, that sentences vary in apparently similar circumstances, and alleging general bias, such as that the judiciary are largely white Anglo-Celtic males who subconscientiously discriminate against females. And that then gives you uh, an overview of allegations of bias with respect to scandalising contempt. That also brings us to an end of this podcast relating to contempt of court. As I said, there are many different types of contempt. The two that we are focusing on are subjudice contempt and scandalising contempt. And what we're overall concerned about is the likelihood um, with which these proceedings are going to interfere with the administration of justice. Thank you, and I will see you next week.